Hey everyone, welcome to the seventh Chebcast. In this one, we're talking about mummies. And we're here with Seventh Outpost, It's a Ghost UK, Hello. and Hello. So High for Hentai. <laughs> okay, <Inhale>. so. Exhale. <laughs> <laughs> so to begin, we'll just talk about like what a mummy is because. Some people were confused, like, what's the difference between a mummy and a zombie? And basically, a mummy is a zombie that's been pr preserved. So, like, if you take a corpse and you preserve it somehow, congratulations, you've got a mummy. And there's many different kinds of mummification. The most common one is the, or the most commonly known one, is the ancient Egyptian method where they would, like, remove the internal organs coat the body in like some kind of salty substance then leave it to dry for a while then they'd fill the cavities up with sawdust and the body might be bathed in wine and spices then wrapped in linen and left for some more time and that's the mummy that everyone's familiar with but there's many more kinds and for a world building kind of perspective the other techniques may be a lot better some of the main benefits of a mummy is that it's got no smell and it's got no decay so you can use it inside a lair whereas zombies you can't and it's also really good if you're making constructs because you can like if you just assemble a construct out of flesh and you don't preserve it in any way it's just going to rot away so you've lost a lot of time you guys want to say anything on those points um yes uh, among other things formaldehyde was used for mummification so um and and nowadays it's used in uh modern essentially uh section rooms and and other such places um for preservation of corpses uh what it does is it um doesn't really damage the issue too much uh it it preserves the tissue and it kills the bacteria pretty effectively so hence why it's used very often uh, if we want to preserve a corpse yeah mm. that's called arterial embalming i think isn't it mm -hmm. so they basically drain all the blood out then pump formaldehyde in i believe among other, other options yeah um wasn't there like um, I'm gonna Google this while I'm saying it, but wasn't there also a thing uh, with when it came to doing mummies and whatnot, um, where they would like get sort of, uh, get like a poker up your nose and sort of like do the brains out and yeah, all they of that. Did. Yeah, the yeah. innards are essentially yeah, like being removed okay. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, question: You know, when it comes to mummies, when it comes to sort of like how they are and whatnot. And I really should have thought of this myself, but um, the organs were put in canopic jars, weren't they? Yes. Yes. Um, right, okay, so with that, you've got you've got the mummy. Could, for board building, could these canopic jars be used to have some kind of influence or compulsion over the mummy? Hmm, it's a good idea. Like a kind, kind of similar of... to a phylactery yeah. for a lich. Yeah, you, you could... Uh... I wouldn't call it a phylactery for, for a lich, but uh, we could use uh, symbolically the way organs, if they're removed, uh, were used or rather were understood. So, for example, with the heart being able to control their will or emotions. So, like, if you steal a mummy's heart or, you know, the heart of, of, of any, like, intelligent mm. undead, you could somehow control their emotions, perhaps. Mm. Yeah. Or maybe like destroying the jars removes the immortality. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea. Um, we have different kinds of uh, on on the document that uh, that you've that you've written on. We've got different types of mummy. We've got Egyptian, tar from out the hide, Zinhui. Is that how you say it? Zinhui. It could be. I'm not sure. It's Chinese. I'd mm. say Zinhui, but I got no clue. Uh, Amber yeah, and I. Which ones would you guys say is the most effective? Because of course you, these are for different environments and you'll have different things with these, but generally. 
I think um, the formaldehyde is probably the most useful one because it, it leaves the tissues supple. So it's basically like a zombie that doesn't rot. Mm. Yeah, if you want to go for like um, uh, quality, but also control formaldehyde. Formaldehyde. If you want to terrify them, then Sinsui is great. Mm -hmm. If you want to what? Terrify them. Wait, I've not seen a Zinsui. Uh, Zin... I've got to say this. You should, you should put in the picture of that thing in there. Uh, or if you're afraid, I can do it for you. Yeah, it's his. Oh, is it, the, is, it the one, is it the one where the guy looks like he's chewed five gum? <laughs> that that is a very accurate description. <laughs> yeah, Zin Sui is like a Chinese princess from like some ancient dynasty, and they put her in some kind of unknown fluid that preserved her in a really weird way. She's all like bloated and translucent looking, and just really disgusting. Mm, yep. I think it's like the most horrifying looking undead I've ever seen, to be honest. Mummy I bomb? think you haven't seen a lot of undead, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that one is pretty scary. Uh, so I believe So High had something to say about the um, various uses of the mummies. Oh, for the mummies themselves. Um, mm -hmm. it, it again, like the problem with mummies is that there is no set power if for any um fantasy world like their mummy uh, their powers can just range from just the you know just simple mummies who don't rot yeah. to the lords of dead but like one um use the earliest way i can see it is there's usually the association of mummies keeping their intelligence so it it's also like kind of like a give and take with the um because, like because like their the... organs because their organs especially if they're preserved in canoptic jars their their organs organs are preserved therefore um I've noticed that this is a trope, uh, is that the zombies can be killed by shooting them in the head. Um, and that's pretty widely common trope. And with skeletons, it's not as often true. The reason for that is that we assume that the, uh, like, like the, the, the organs of, of zombies partially take over the work of the spell. Or whatever it is that we're, you know, making a zombie with, be it a virus or something, right? So, like, if you shoot a zombie in the head, you know, the brain goes. And if we have an undead that, you know, j just like a zombie has their organs, in a way, work in some, you know, strange manners. Maybe the brain is used for thinking, but it's kept in a jar, so it's safe in a way. So, like... Yeah. Yeah, if, if if they 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 aren't damaged, then all the better. Oh god, imagine imagine if a, if a mummy just like fucks up and the and the guy who's just or the the person who's just sort of raised it is just there going, "You failed me." Yeah, I'm gonna have to take your brain in the jar. I'm gonna have to shake it now. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you motion sickness. It's not gonna pass. <laughs> I'm gonna have to take a brain jar now. <laughs> um, that, is, that would be a terrible torture. Imagine. Uh, reanimating someone and like making them a mummy, and then putting their uh, their brain in like uh, some kind of like tumble machine, like a tumble. Jar. Oh yeah, oh, 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 that would be a terrible torture. Oh Christ! Especially because of heat as well. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. It's almost like a voodoo doll. Yes, at some point, yeah. that's actually true. That is actually true. Oh, uh, the only thing that could make it worse is if it was a German tumble dryer, because those things just will not Shit. break down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just keep going and going. <laughs> uh, those those Germans, they sure have uh, they have uh, ways to uh, to to um, make a person unhappy, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I just, I listen to that, and the first thing I can think of is, is World War One, World War Two, Bismarck, and just all of the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, coming back to the actual. 
<laughs> yeah, we don't, we, don't, we don't want this to be like the ghouls one where we're talking about space. <laughs> um, um, I'd, I'd like to ask you guys, can you think of any other benefits to a, a mummy besides the no spell, no smell, no decay? Is there anything other? Oh, I did, I did write a little thing about that when it came to uh, diseases. Uh, this is for world building because. Cool. cool. Uh, so mummies, right. You, right? Now correct me if I'm wrong, but mummies, am I correct in saying, on will not be good for uh, transmitting diseases normally? Mm. That's they, true. Ooh, well, that depends, but like, yeah. I mean, like Egyptian right. formaldehyde, like like normal mummies that are done by people. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they probably aren't that good at transmitting diseases now. So I wrote a little, uh, about a page long, page, page and a bit long thing um, when, it came, when it comes to using mummies. And um, basically it kind of like goes into using mummies to save diseases. So what you do is you get a mummy, you slap a disease on it, like, like, like you just go, diseases on it, and as you do. And then you, you so it's on, it's on the mummy, then you freeze it, as in you put it in the freezer, you put it in Greenland, you put it in... The snow-capped peaks of Russia. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's you actually it, a pretty good idea. But you the, put it the, the problem so to preserve is, that. The problem is the medium on the disease, right? Because mm. that's part of the reason um, why mummies could have been thought to have been cursed. Because, like, how should I say it? You shouldn't dig out dead, you know. And like, mummies are uh, pretty well kept, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. like they're not like the usual you know you, you dig a corpse up in the ground and there's nothing left of it within like you know a few years right sometimes sometimes sooner mm. and but but like with mummies it's like it's gonna stick around for like hundreds of years so part of the reason for curses and and that sort of logic could be like you know don't don't go looking for for undead don't go don't go digging you know well i could all i could because they carry disease, um, well, and I mean, well, like, 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 like legit, like, 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 how should I say? It? So, some of the way uh, mummies were made in the Middle East, Far East, sometimes, is they basically left their dead wrapped up in something in the in the sand, essentially. And the sand was, and I, I imagine that there's some more logic to it. But long story short, the sand. Uh, had some form of preserving capacity, right? Mm -hmm. But like, thus preserved dead can still carry some kind of disease. You know, I, I wouldn't touch that. So, yeah, yeah. The like the the, the logic of so, but but the bigger issue is is like, um, how would you preserve the medium in which yeah. the disease is, right? Because it would be it would have to be like some kind of like what spit or like. Um, or phlegm or something like that, etc. Right? It's, those things don't always last that long. Viruses and, and bacteria and whatnot. Um, that's you just you just got me thinking now. As in, like, no, because you know when you get a new uh, CD or a DVD and it's got that new smell mm -hmm. to it, right? Mm -hmm. And you bust open a mummy. What's it going to smell like? Is it literally just cracking open a cold one with the boys and you got that fresh mummy smell or what? Hmm. Uh, or is it or is it going to smell like an old people's home times 10 i think oh, it's going to smell like ash but I, I don't it depends like too on the preservation method yeah. yeah this is true if it's ice you can't smell shit it's just cold yeah yeah you can smell the cold um this is true also, real quick, imagine me the first guy discovering a mummy. It's like you're going over some weird ass place. You're seeing this kind of things. You're seeing this coffee. It's like, oh, okay, cool. I got my oh cry. It would be pretty scary. Um, <laughs> yeah, that'd be so just hilarious to see. That actually brings me to like a point. First reaction. Um, mm -hmm. in my mind, like a mummy is like a good compromise between a skeleton and a zombie because mm. the flesh retains that kind of horror aspect that's lost with a skeleton. Like skeletons are probably the cutest form of undead. <laughs> is there any better term? I mean, <laughs> like least <laughs> despicable or least least disgusting. I think yeah. least emotionally lethal. 
But... I don't know. I don't know why, but all I can think of, like for the cutest form of, un- of undead, is that fucking film, uh, Cockney's Skeleton versus with a with a <laughs> with a bow tie on his. On his... It's uh, you got this film called Cockneys vs. Zombies, and there's a scene where this uh, this guy discovers a zombie baby, and he picks it up and it tries to bite him, so he just drop kicks it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds about right. And it, and then it, and then it hits like a billboard for domestic abuse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually have a point that I'm going to make to what Negver is going to say. Sorry, not Negver. Negver, uh, so high it's going to say. <laughs> Because uh, I know you mentioned something about the um, using them as sort of like the, the 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 mummies as like leaders for your army. Yeah, because the fact that they maintain a certain level of intelligence allows them to be either like spellcasters, um, undead priests, or uh, leaders. Especially that the fact that a lot of like the proper mummies were like leaders priests pharaohs themselves yeah. right if you if you weren't important you weren't mummified unless you're like yeah. directly someone's slave yeah i mean i mean you could theoretically in a way like preserve the corpse under the sand that's that's how like commoners were mummified but like aside from that um, yeah. oh christ just rare. Just, just imagine that. Just like, oh, okay, so I'm gonna die. So, so where am I going to go? Oh, you're going to go in this yeah. ditch right here next to this bit of water. You're, gonna, <laughs> you're like, you, you need to ditch your own grave, and and this is you're gonna go in in six feet deep in this fucking. Uh, there's 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 a, there's a pigsty right next to it. Okay, and where's the pharaoh gonna go? He's gonna go in that great big in that massive, awe inspiring pyramid over there with 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 limestone on it and golden I mean, and golden that's, caps. And that's the very point of what pharaohs wear. And it's kind of like a physical manifestation of the thing. Like pharaohs were considered gods, right? Right. So, so like, of course, that they built them pyramids that were like almost like in almost like temples and such, like like seats of power in the afterlife. So, um, I think if we want to storytell or world build, we can use that particular fact that you know pharaohs were either considered gods. Or we have been gods in some way. Honestly, I'm thinking of ideas right now of incorporating that into my world. Yeah, with, with necromancy. Exactly. Like, because I mean, the, I mean, it's, yeah. So the thing about pharaohs is like they were a b- bit like a confusion between. I don't wanna. I don't wanna say it's it. I don't wanna judge it. But long story short, ancient Egypt no longer is a thing. So. I can judge it all I want, but long story short, they were in a way a confusion between the um, symbol of a king or like the, the 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 archetype of a king versus the particular manifestation of a king. You know, I don't know like, why, but I I want I want to have like you know how on um, documentaries how you have like this uh, like old sort of. Uh, blokes on there with like white hair and, and wrinkles. Okay, but let, let me let me actually finish my point. So right, right. like like they basically thought that every pharaoh was like the the uh, manifestation, like the thing, the you know the ultimate king, the god king per se, mm. and and that was that was like their culture, uh, and because of that, um, you know pharaohs had very very large degree of power but of course the point was that they you know built the pyramids for them okay yeah um two things uh, two things one i was gonna say imagine like having a documentary where you've got like this the these old sort of historians that have spent their entire lifetime studying history and then mm-hmm. when it comes and then when it comes to this ancient aged aged person there go uh summarizing Egypt see it's just there going Egypt was a confusion um <laughs> and uh, the, I, the wouldn't, thing... I wouldn't I wouldn't say that I think there is a certain error that they could have made but like mm. I think you can summarize a lot of old civilizations that have fallen that way you know yeah 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 um, and the other thing I was going to say is, like, imagine if we had that in Europe. Imagine if the if uh, you had 
great big massive churches uh, just like with spires reaching up to the clouds or, or something along those lines and uh, there is... we almost have those though almost have you looked at <laughs> have you literally looked at hagia sophia like uh, i'm i'm typing uh what's it called uh you mean i mean the 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 vatican uh and like oh, right. the the yeah the vatican the... church yeah the the vatican um oh that I think one it's called hagia sophia but no, I meant, I meant, I meant like, I meant like, sort of like oh, tall, gee. like, like uh, way too Hagia tall. Yeah, is in is in Istanbul. Uh, the, it's it's called a different thing. It's. Mm... Yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's from Civ Five. I remember building the building, but I don't remember the name of it. Uh, it's the Holy Z. There you go. That's the name for it. <laughs> the Holy C. Okay. The only, the only, uh, the only explanation I have for it, uh, for for me forgetting it, is because I'm not a native. I knew the word in, in my native language, but I didn't know it in English. So, but like, um, I kind, I kind of mean this, but like, like, wait, like much, much taller. So, but and more grand on scale. Like, like, imagine, imagine you've got mm -hmm. this, but much, much, much bigger. And why is it all done? Because one guy is dead. Say mm -hmm. the Pope, say the Pope mm -hmm. dies, you, you buried the fucker in there. Yeah, yeah. But like, mm, the power slowly started to go away from singular individuals. And you can see that mm. all over it. As, as history progresses, you know, you can see in the very ancient times, you know, you can see enormous, you know, wonders of the world built for like a single guy. And then, you know, for a whole religion, the, the, um the the cathedrals and and other buildings not i would say quite matching the whole thing in in scale at least mm -hmm. arguably i would say that the holy z is pretty damn intricate and pretty damn beautiful but um yeah arguably in scale especially that it's, it was it wasn't made for like one guy you know Imagine if you had a world where you had, uh, where you had, like these great big cities, but each city was actually intended to be a burial place for one, mm -hmm. for like, for like, well, I say for one person, but uh, for uh, yeah. like past past rulers and and all of the subjects would sort of like live there as kind of like a, you know, like uh, continuing on the person's legacy and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you could, like you could have sort of like a um, Tomb King's Warhammer thing, wherein you've mm -hmm. got like all of these. Um, these great elaborate sort of tombs and burial places where people of power and all of their uh, shit, all of their armies, all of their stuff would be sort of like interred in. Um, but, as, but as time goes on, and say like the roof like sort of like comes down and it crumbles, and but well, people still live there, so they could incorporate the ruins into buildings and whatnot. So you, you know, you know how you have like um, desecrated sort of run down uh, graveyards where like the buildings are sort of Mm -hmm. dilapidated uh, you can only see like bits of stone jutting out and you can see like maybe a half of a window and so on imagine that except you've got new stone mixing with the old where the where it's been repaired and upkept to some degree arguably you might be forced to like um redo the whole thing yeah yeah you redo yeah. great parts of it because like if you have stone that's too old it's just gonna fall apart mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I mean, it, it, stone holds itself together pretty well, but like, no. Um, can I ask a question to you, Seventh? Because I know you've got the formaldehyde yes. knowledge. Basically, like, a modern mortician, when they're making a formaldehyde zombie, is pretty much meant as like a short-term thing just to uh, make a, a corpse look let's better. Let's say modern morticians don't really do formaldehyde <laughs> zombies. But, yeah. um, I, I don't personally know any modern necromancers but, <laughs> but sure I'll, I'll try to help you yeah what i mean, I mean is like tells you kind of how to find yeah what i mean is like um, when they're preparing a corpse it's just meant for the funeral and beyond that it doesn't really matter what happens so like my question is if you were to make a formaldehyde zombie how long would it actually hold up oh um i mean we have uh I wouldn't call them zombies, but we have de facto corpses in uh, our, you know, university, uh, and they're constantly submerged in formaldehyde, and they're only taken out 
uh, for you know for for working with them. If you don't disturb it, it can lie. And of course, if you have like some some means of keeping the formaldehyde in or supplying it constantly, because mm. formaldehyde, you know, it's it, it's a it's a mixture of alcohol. It's going to evaporate. So if you have uh, means of like keeping it in, it, you can keep it like almost indefinitely. It, it can it can hold for like like decades, if not centuries, probably. Um, in in a purely theoretical situation, have, because like like the innards and such that kept very well, like really that that kept pretty pretty well um, in formaldehyde. So more or less, yeah, you can you can totally have a, a pretty well preserved corpse that being said however taking them out let's say it decreases there because you no know, of course they're going to dry up a little bit they're going to get damaged by the external factors so mm-hmm. obviously it's it's going to to i would honestly say i mean corpses in our in our university being you know poked and prodded by students usually don't last more than a few decades um another question what are the effects of the formaldehyde upon both the the appearance of the flesh and also its kind of um substance like does it get softer or harder um i i, I don't know if i can make a very a, 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 the best case because let's say I haven't I haven't uh, cut up a person fresh and like poked them I've <laughs> I haven't <laughs> let's say let's say um, done a lot of um, done a lot of touching during the surgeries uh, but there's something to say about that but I'm not going I'm, to <laughs> I'm about the under touching. the impression that a lot of you know poking prodding and, and such during the uh, I haven't done that, um, but in general, among other th- among other reasons for that is the rigor mortis. But generally, a corpse is much less mobile after death, uh, and in formaldehyde, it it seems to 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 sort of preserve that state. So, if you were to use formaldehyde mummies as like a kind of soldier. You'd have to be constantly bathing them to keep them sort of preserved. Um, arguably, you could you could certainly keep them much longer than anything else, but you theoretically you could do something like you could like dress them in rags or something that are soaked with formaldehyde. Hmm. Or option two is you uh, soak them and then put on the rags to keep it from drying too fast and that way you can you can keep them up pretty decently question Um, because i feel we're not taking into account the environmental factors when it comes to all of this because if you've got a mummy that's walking about so not only are they walking about being exposed to the elements but they're walking through god knows what they could be walking through mud they could be walking through uh underbrush flora they could be walking you know Yeah, 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 yeah yeah and they could be taking damage all the while um for the for whatever kind of setting what is the best way of actually getting formaldehyde to actually do it because if if you can't get enough to warrant an effective means of actually using them then it would be a lot more trouble than it was worth yeah how effective is it going to be i that depends on how easy to get formaldehyde is in your setting if it's easy to get then sure it's worth it to a certain degree how but, how do you make how do you make it i know that alcohol is involved and there's um, a joke there's a joke to be made there about uh, dying completely long covered in story alcohol. short you need to uh it's one of the for example byproducts uh of like how should i say it's one of the byproducts of regular ferment- fermentation so like oh, if right. you don't distill you can get um yeah if you don't distill properly, you can get uh, formalic, um If I'm correct, it's formic acid. There you go. That's the English name for it. Um, All right. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's that's one of the one of the means of getting. But like, you can get it through fermentation. Like some certain bacteria produce it. Okay, um, so technically you can never run out of it then, because oh, yeah, okay. Mm, you need to give them something to eat, and it takes a while. It's like saying you can never run out of alcohol. Like, no, I say, I say that. that I, like... I say that more in the sense of how pop because of how popular alcohol is, you can't mm. really run out of it because there's always a demand for it. So it's yeah. I don't think the the, the byproduct part is. Hmm. I have another question. Go on. If you, like, let's say you've built a perfect kind of construct, like you've mm -hmm. spent a lot of time on it, now you want to preserve it. What kind of preservation method is going to hold up the best in a combat situation? In a combat situation? If you mean undead construct, right? Yep. Um, if I were to preserve it, then what I would do is I would make as... I would put it in an armor and I would make it as I would say dense or rather not dense as much as like as I said uh, dense, inaccessible man. as inaccessible to air as possible. That's very and vulnerable, it isn't it? Motherhide would work. So basically Just... as soon as the armor gets punctured, it's going to start going backwards well, 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 not that fast you know it's not going to like 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 it doesn't it's not going to dry immediately um a lot of the corpses we worked on were just you know like lying there for like hours on end like you know and and, and they were still mostly mostly intact i would say the students did significantly more damage to them with <laughs> with their with their little little uh, anatomical picks than <laughs> than the lack of formaldehyde did arguably um but yeah yeah no uh, i would i would totally say that um probably something like like armor or like formaldehyde soaked rags over a form formaldehyde soaked construct and then armor on top of that that would be that would be pretty effective honestly what about tar tar is interesting as well you could have isn't, like sorry isn't tar on. like oh sorry isn't tar mostly sort of hot though um yeah like when tar cooled isn't isn't like a whole problem like trying to get yourself out tar if it's cooled like, one it, like me, it's like just like a cool yeah. tar mummy would have an issue just move, mo uh, run, uh, moving around in general. I did write something about that. Uh, there is actually, um, there is like, uh, I, th I believe it's like human anatomy expeditions, exposition, whatever it was called. Um, but long story short, there's basically uh, like a, like a, like a thing um, out there. Let me actually look it up but um ex exposition is when you explain it on a ship um expedition is when you go out on an adventure with the boys <laughs> oh human anatomy ex exhibition there you go uh um, yeah yes human uh, i believe the um the things the the the, the various uh, human corpses in the human anatomy exposition sorry exhibition <laughs> um <laughs> are covered in resin if i'm correct and resin and and granted they are they are static so you couldn't coat them perfectly but yeah i believe they are static but i think the similar a similar form of resin could be uh, a solution to you to your quandary um it wouldn't be as mobile, honestly, but it would probably preserve the soft tissue. It's just that you would basically leave like joints uncovered and they could rot relatively easily because of mm. that. What if like just coming back to the tar for a minute, what if you have your, your construct, right? And you've soaked right. it in formaldehyde and it's thoroughly sort of drenched in it and it's gotten into all the cracks and whatever and then you put a very thin layer of tar over the outside to sort of keep the moisture in 
but not so much that it's going to like uh, inhibit movements. Mm -hmm. Would that work? I think, yeah. I think theoretically that could work. I did write a little thing about, like, should, should I read what I've got written down for tar mummies? Sure. Uh, uh, so when tar pits are mentioned, people typically think of bubbling, boiling sludge pits, you know, as black as night, harboring all manner of animals ensnared in its seven clutches. A shame that's... What the fuck did I write? A shame that's such a not greatly used for fantasy. So it can be used with slimes or elementals to ensnare prey, animal, human, monster, etc, etc. A process can even be done wherein a tar creature would go through the process of mummifying a living being, only to regurgitate the now mummified corpse for use whenever it is needed. Along with this, a living... Uh, t a living... I put car instead of tar. <laughs> a living Volkswagen oh, beetle. Um... A living tar uh, can fill a mummy in order to fill it out and make it more useful. So staying under the flesh, yet wrapping around the bones to offer a layer of sticky protection. So what you could do with that, like if somebody was to um, attack a mummy and the mummy's got like tar on it, uh, inside it, then it would not only would the sword get stuck in the tar, but you've also got the whole thing of, you know, with, it, with the tar being inside the mummy, you can also uh, sort of lash out and attack when needed or sort of stick to the or stick you get the mummy stuck to the armor or get the uh, armor of the person or get the uh, mummy stuck to the person or asphyxiate them or whatnot hmm. i don't really know enough about uh to go into the science of it, so i haven't really done that much in that regard but you could always could always use like sort of tar elemental or slimes or whatnot to transport things from uh place <laughs> a to place b yeah. Although, although with it being tar, everything else is going to get stuck in there as well. So when you get to the final destination, you look at you look at your tar creature, and it's just covered in like leaves, sticks. Someone's poodle is stuck to the side of it. You know, it's got it's got like a few stop signs here and there. Yeah, just sticking out of it. When we say tar, are we talking about like bitumen, or what is it exactly? I was thinking tar is in like uh, the stuff, the stuff that prehistoric animals would get stuck in, like in the ground, like the boiling stuff. Yeah. But what is That's... that like? Like, what is it chemically? Uh, tar tar is the product. Uh, I, I'm ninety percent sure it's kind of like what the, uh, what the oil is. In a way, which is, yep, uh, huh. yeah, it's derived from petroleum, coal tar, etc. It's it's similar stuff to to what oil is. It's just you know thicker. Uh, so it's, it's basically, basically bitumen. Less... Yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds bitumen. <laughs> yeah. So it's basically the stuff they coat the roads in. Yeah. Hmm. Be be me, human, living in living in a human society, coat roads with with dead dinosaurs. <laughs> find out find out that prehistoric animals would get uh, ensnared and killed by goop made from dead dinosaurs. My face went dead dinosaurs are behind everything. <laughs> literally though, literally we are literally. The, the, the whole foundation of our society is dead dinosaurs, literally. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's petroleum yeah. seep. It's it's so yeah, it's petroleum seep and bitumen uh, and and other such things. But long story short, yeah, that's that's essentially um, what tar is made of. Is it's similar stuff to like it's coal and like oil that sort of. Imagine. Um, oh wait, no, this. Is... I was gonna say something that's not mummy related. I'm gonna say it, and then I'm just, and then move on. Right. Just imagine in the future, like after humanity's dead, you've got like this this alien advanced alien race that comes to Earth, sucks sucks up our tar, and uses us to power their um, 10G towers back home. Could have it. So, like, just from our discussion just then. It seems to me that like a combination of formaldehyde and tar would probably be the most practical mummy. 
Oh God! Imagine. I'm just. I'm just imagining like tar from out of the hide. Like, like, like just sort of like ale that is tar. And I'm just. I'm just imagining trying to pour that into a glass, and you're just going to be there for five hours, <laughs> just right. just trying to get it out of the bottle. Just come on, come on, come They're on. Probably so just like light it on fire. Uh, how flammable would it be? Both of them Ooh. actually, because because one's alcohol and the other one's tar. So it would be oh, very flammable, I think. Like fire yeah. arrows aren't that effective in fantasy, but if you've got if you've got a mummy, then yes, <sighs> it's flammable. Yeah, I, so... and I mean I mean like tissue is flammable as well, but mm. um, often not as much as we would want. Yeah, I think uh... regarding the mummy types, every kind of mummy except for the for the uh, ice mummy and maybe Sin Sui would be flammable because. Essentially, you've yes. got desiccated flesh, which is completely yes. dry. It's going to be very easy to burn. Yeah. Um, speaking of the ice, I did do a little thing for the ice mummy. Um, and that was this goes back to sort of like uh, storing diseases in, in mummies for later use. Should I like uh, quickly like, skim over the or just call, sort of go through what I've got written down for this part of the world building? Yeah, I'd like to say a bit about ice mummies too once you're done. Uh, Thank you very much. All right, so <clears throat> lichens that survive for thousands of years, if not longer, can and will develop in multiple areas. You don't live that long without learning or experiencing, unless you're sleeping. Something we see in fantasy of plagues unleashed by necromancers and liches towards a desired effect, either quickly making an undead army, winning wars of attrition against the living, so on and so forth. The problem with any disease is that the hosts can eventually become immune, develop a cure. Or if the disease has a high mortality rate, inadvertently destroy itself. Like, uh, take rabies for example. Like, that is one hundred percent. Like, if you have that, you're and you and you don't have um, a cure done very quickly, you're dead. And that's not as you compare that. You compare that to uh, COVID. It's yeah. A way to rectify this can be using the long-lasting nature of mummies. Simply put, infecting a corpse with a potent strain of the disease before either freezing them in ice or amber, then saving said corpse to be unearthed and used later on may be a worthwhile and useful thing to do. It not only saves the literature or necromancer the hassle of needing to create a new disease, but should the need arise, they can easily alter the existing one when required. Add things onto it or alter it in a way that suits the different environment. The issues with this can be along the lines of realism. A disease can survive in ice. Amber is a different story. Ice freezes and preserves, whereas amber can be in a variety of places. If amber is unreliable, then ice is what is required, which means the literal necromancer needs a source of constant cold they can reliably use when needed. This can be achieved either through the use of a pocket dimension, teleporting to Greenland, or using ice magic to constantly keep the corpse frozen and preserved. Another issue can be with time, inconvenience, or even the development of technology. So with time, the disease may itself be impractical, and should it prove to be so devastating that people lock themselves in small communities, then the recurring iteration won't be as useful. For example, it was thanks to the Black Death that plague doctors happened, and consequently quarantine measures were developed to better combat disease. This is not taking into account magic that can outright cure a disease, or fantasy races specifically immune to it. And if a literal necromancer made something so devastating that it would change the culture of a people to be more quarantine-focused, diseases won't nearly be as nearly effective. You can wipe out one village, but that's just going to be one village compared to all of the rest. Inconvenience, leaving a corpse in the frozen wastes of somewhere as a means to preserve it is all fine and dandy before something happens to mess it up. Animals can eat and peck at it, should they find it, and get infected themselves. The changing environment can mean it is lost forever, especially if events transpire in the world to change the environment. Say, for example, an elf queen tries to bring demons into the world for a magic swimming pool, only to split Pangea into different continents. Along with this, should the corpse be found by mortal explorers, they can both either infect themselves and kill a lot of people, or quickly develop a cure for future diseases of this type. Which means you're fucked either way. Technology. Whilst magic is, is especially useful, the development of technology cannot be ignored. If a lich sleeps for several eternities only to wake and find itself a relic in a vastly updated world with, uh, with elven bioengineering and dwarf power armor, Diseases that have been saved cannot be reliably uh, cannot be reliably used, especially when said diseases can be reverse engineered or broken apart with with superior medical advancements. This leads on to something else that needs to be mentioned when using mummies: the fact that by nature life follows brutal Darwinism. 
plants, animals, and bacteria, everything living evolves and changes to better suit the environment. Undead that were created yesterday, yesterday that still are useful because the living creatures are adapted to the proper environment. Mummies, especially those of long dead races, animals, or flora, cannot be reliably used against certain types of threats or opponents. A mummy can be saved indefinitely, but it is whether it is still useful that is something which I feel is a topic of discussion. An example can follow a T-Rex. Despite its size, if it trips and falls over, it will sustain nasty, nasty injuries, especially when at speed, which speaking of, according to Google, the max speed of a T-Rex is 27 kilometers per hour. So maybe not that fast. Skeletons need not worry about such limitations. Zombies can be weighed down by the flesh, but if they fall over, they can still carry on. A mummy, however, might not have such luxuries, especially considering all the effort that has gone into preserving it. Okay. So, it's... I know, I know there's a lot there, but... Yeah, um, yeah. about the T-Rex thing, and it's slightly mm. going off on a tangent, but not too much of a tangent, and we'll get off it right after I say this. Right. But I was reading up on, like, what would happen if you brought a T-Rex into the modern world, and, like, you'd think it'd do pretty well, but it'd actually probably die, because... Yeah. First of all, it's too slow to catch anything. Like, modern um, herbivores and stuff are very quick. Mm. So it would probably just starve to death for that reason, but it would also you be can destroyed. See it coming, you can see it coming a mile away, and there's no guarantee it will survive because of diseases in the modern world. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I meant, like, bring it back as in, like, having a mummy, a mummified T-Rex. I think it so, would you be go all, so you go through all of this effort of, get, of doing it, only for it to then prove to be a tad bit shit. <laughs> I can't see how it's it would be shit. It's an effective bodyguard, but that's kind of at most you can release it for because of the fact that it's too slow. Mm. Like you can make guard certain areas just become the ultimate like the just the living door, but you can't really do too much else. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Also, like another F, um, uh, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure this is decent enough. Like a. Uh, I'm not sure if they also be able to breathe properly in this uh, certain thing because the atmosphere back then was yeah. drastically different compared to now. Because True. bugs yeah. used to be humongous. Yeah, like, that they was were the... absolute shitlords. Uh, that was during the Carboniferous time period, and that was when uh, the atmosphere was made up of what thirty percent oxygen, which is quite a bit more now compared to what we have now. And the reason yep. uh, bugs got so big is because they had less. Uh, with more oxygen, they they needed to have less breathing organs. Um, to actually, you know, survive and whatnot. So because of this, it meant that they could have uh, more space for other organs to go, so they just kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger. So on and so forth. It also kind of... Uh, I think it's also to do with the fact that because you've got more oxygen, it means that they're taking in a lot more, so they're kind of, like, growing bigger, and I may be incorrect on that one, though. I'm pretty sure they were huge. Like, mm. like were, monkeys yeah. had oh. to fight them. Yeah, no, the, yeah, Alpha Pura, for example, which is like a millipede, was about six foot long. It could reach up to that. <laughs> um, Mesophile uh, is about a spider. It is, the body is about as big as your head, and it's got like legs fucking sticking out of it. There's quite a few. Oh, you, had, you had, um, it was, it was that big, it would be haunting house cats if it was around today. <laughs> That's Christ. Uh, right. You had big dragonflies. You had those all sorts. Those all sorts. Let's steer it back onto the topic. Yes. All right. So, ice mummies. I wanted to say something about that. Basically, if you're in a cold climate, then pretty much every undead you have is a kind of ice mummy. Because it's not going to be rotting as fast. If you've got zombies and you're in Antarctica, you've got ice mummies, right? That's actually a really good question. Because when it comes to that, all I can think of is if you get a zombie and you raise it, and you take it to uh, to a really cold place, does that then become an ice mummy? Or do you need to have it roll around in the snow for a full day for it to then become an ice mummy? I don't think so. Or, 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 or like an icy undead? I think that, like, if you're, you've got a corpse and it's being preserved by cold, then it's a mummy. Mount Everest has got to be like one of the best places for that shit. Then, holy, yeah. Uh, yes, actually, oh, yeah. a lot of the corpses on Mount Everest are, in fact, pretty well preserved and uh, pretty good means of scaring tourists. Also, nobody got to like getting them down, so they're like some of yeah. them, are, like, yeah, 
So, are they aren't they used as markers to sort yes, of literal, yeah literal yeah I mean if, and of course keeping keeping in lines with repeating the meme that we've probably all seen once everyone every every dead corpse on on the on Mount Everest was once a very enthusiastic person yay <laughs> yeah. yeah now oh. it's a very en enthusiastic corpse mm. another thing about ice mummies is that if you have like a person right and they die in the snow or whatever they freeze to death the the corpse that gets left behind is typically very horrific looking like um if you google yeah, isn't, that, isn't that because of the frostbite or whatnot probably uh i don't know exactly what the process is but if you google ice mummies you'll see various kinds and the newer ones look kind of like a frozen person but the older they get the more they sort of become horrific looking like there's um there's some ancient people i don't know how ancient they are but one of them is like a child and it's been frozen and it's got no eyes anymore it's just got these like black holes oh god and it's got that I'm kind looking of at, i'm looking at this one picture and it's got like a little measuring bar with like a and a thing underneath it which points north and i looked at it and i thought to myself oh, i don't remember seeing this in skyrim <laughs> <laughs> god damn yeah, and, and I can yeah, I can see the. It's, you've got you've got like this one that it's like a mummified kid. And it's got no eyes, and it looks really sort of yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Imagine, oh Christ! Imagine in the fantasy world, you you, you go up to this place, and you're up to this frozen place to explore it, and in the dead of night, you just sort of see this shambling person, and then just he looks at you, and it's got like this, it's this eyeless frozen preserved body and it's just there and it's just looking at you and you're looking at it and then it just fucks off <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't even attack you it just fucks off and you just think to yourself what in the fuck yeah i think the horror value is pretty high for an ice mummy to be honest mm, especially yes, it's pretty well preserved yeah i think that another thing to take into account as well when it comes to sort of with ice mummies compared to a lot of other environments like compared to say um, more European focused uh, fantasy worlds where you know it's it's like it's it's in discount budget Europe there's there's gonna be there is the possibility that there's so many people there and this there's, there's magic there's, there's necromancy you can to an extent you have some modicum of safety yeah because you're not just by yourself even if you're in your own shack you're still in your own native lands there's the kingdom there's the castle there's uh, armies there's um, law and order you know, you've got all these things into account, which does grant some safety. And, and you, you're in a place that you know and know quite well, so you've got that. But when it comes to being in like a frozen sort of wasteland, or exploring a really frozen place, and you're by yourself, or you're with a small team of other people, you're in a place you're unfamiliar with, in an environment that's harsh, that's incredibly harsh and can easily kill you if you're not prepared, in a place that you know nothing about, and to see that walking around you'd probably be shit bricks for sure because the implications alone would be very uh, upsetting um moving along to the next point i've got here i wanted to talk to you guys about do you think that mummy is a kind of an underappreciated kind of undead yes yes i do yeah I think so too. They're so underused to the point there. There's literal like varying power levels to the point where, like I said, it's just zombies to actual gods. Like there's no like set standard. The way that um, I, I did put down something for you for uses of mummies, but even with everything I've gotten down, I feel that the only like the best ways that you can use them is for magic users, uh, like more tanky magic users that are not just skeletons. Um, advisors, so you uh, you get a mummy from a long dead person who used to have a powerful position or like a really good position, and you could use and you could like if you get this person's soul and you, you just slow uh, slap it in and raise them and whatnot, you could use them to impart wisdom from the past and learn about the past and so on and so forth. Because you because if they have um, technology or teachings or magic or whatever that has been long forgotten by history, you can absolutely benefit greatly from that. Um, I did do something about I did write something about using mummies in layers for ambush stuff as in you put them into the walls and ground and whatnot. 
So if there's an intruder, they claw out and attack the person, or they, they would just wake up and attack. Kind of like the draw green Skyrim. Like, they just get up and wake up, and they're just like, oh, shit, you're in my room. Die. That's a good idea. I mean, the Draugr are basically mummies in the way they're portrayed in Skyrim. Um, they're also... Aren't, so isn't there, like, sort of, like, an unconfirmed, genuinely believed theory that Draugr are the ones that, have, that are sort of looking after these... Um, Nord burial places because yeah. they've got like they've got like candles lit you've got treasure rooms you've got all this stuff like they are the ones that are taking care of it all and looking after the place i mean they c there's candles and torches conveniently placed in all the dungeons in yeah Skyrim. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah which is so, a big point of contention in my opinion mm, so all of them also lit yeah so it could so it could be that you could in place of say using zombies or skeletons because of how mummies are you could use them for more sort of butler servant roles. Yeah, I think so. Compared to, compared to others, they are a lot more cleaner, aren't they? A lot more hygienic. Yes, um, certainly more so than zombies, but I think they're less hygienic than skeletons. Another thing it also is uh, with mummies as well is like not just like mummies, but like the mo whole mummification process, unlike um. If you like your lich and you like have like a cult leader and it's like you want to keep certain members around for like you know eternity, you can just like mummify him real quick. Mm. Yeah. I'm just I'm just picturing that. Just like you got a cult and they don't have a lot of resources, so it's like, okay, we're on to mummy. What do we do? Well, we've got Fosters and Boddingtons. Just just drown just drown them in there and just you know <laughs> job done. You, just, I'm just shoving just... you in sand. Just get some Jack Daniels in there. <laughs> get, get some vodka and whiskey. <laughs> so, um, uh, the next point I've gotten written down is like the practical problems of mummies, because if you were to take it completely realistically, most of these mummies are going to be useless. Like the Egyptian ones are probably stiff as a board and they'll mm -hmm. crumble to dust the moment they try to move. Ice I did ones, write... I did write something else down about using them, um, but go, uh, go on, go on, sorry. The yeah, ice ones are also like completely stiff, and I guess it also crumbled to pieces the moment they moved. The only one that's really practical seems to be the formaldehyde one and the tar one. Assuming you're doing it in some kind of more realistic kind of way, which I don't... That, that works, yeah. Yeah. I don't really agree with that. I'd just say, okay, they're... They're Egyptian mummies and they're walking around and it's okay that way. Would I be correct in saying that to properly use a mummy, you would need absolute top-notch knowledge of how to, of of medical practices and all of that lot, like body preservation, to effectively use them? Because I feel like for an average person to be raising one, uh, to be raising or preparing a mummy and all of that they won't have the proper skills or they won't have the proper education or whatever to do that. Because yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of work involved and there's a lot of things involved, so there's also a lot of time involved and a lot of ingredients. Um yeah. should I go through uh, the little thing I've got about mummy mounts? Sure, go for it. Cheers. Uh, so whilst using mummies is all well and good, we have a perfect opportunity to utilize something special and unique amongst mummies. A great deal of care has gone into them surviving against the rages of time and the elements. In my mind, mummies would make for excellent mounts. Something can be said about the impracticality of a skeletal horse when put into actual practice. The bones can get stuck on flora, the spine can be uncomfortable unless the saddle were extra thick, extra thick, and there is no guarantee a skeletal horse can support a rider. Let alone move or run with run. Now, for that, to kind of like go on to that, look at Arvac from Skyrim. Look at how skinny that bastard is, and look <laughs> at and watch and try and watch that. In all seriousness, riding around with the Dragonborn on its back, decked out in super heavy Dragonbone armor, just just or Daedric armor, just how like i looked at its legs and uh, its bone legs and i just thought to myself how in the fuck does this work i mean to a certain extent in some fantasies is 
As long as you put necrotic energy, it just does all the rest of the work. It just keeps shit together. Like, can you imagine, like, a skeleton, like, a weak, feeble skeleton just recently raised, decked out in the highest tier of armor, and lobbing a whole-ass hammer into another person's face? I mean, uh, fair enough. Yeah. It's, it's, it's some some liberties are taken. Sure. Yeah, depending on the fantasy setting, it's like, you either have to prepare the corpse entirely, or it's just... It's like... I imbue you with my will. Now work, bitch. But you don't have to carry more at <laughs> that point. Uh, well, zombie horses are better for this. The rotting can cause issues all on its own. Because, of, uh, and and I don't think we need to go into that. Because when it comes to like going on a zombie horse, it's it's yeah. No, nobody <laughs> wants nobody wants that. No. Or like, pestilence. Oh god! I mean, imagine just imagine the smell and oh, especially <laughs> like especially like if the rot gets on your clothes and yeah, that's not, that's that stain's not coming out. Yeah. Uh, while zombie horses are better for this, the rotting can cause issues on its own. Because of this, embalming and modifying the mummified horse can work wonders. Should it be preserved in such a way that the muscle is useful, then there is less of a need to magically enhance the undead mount. The spines can be filed down to provide more comfort for the rider, and more importantly, the mummified horse can work incredibly well against flora, ensuring that it isn't ensnared or caught by pesky bushes, thorns, or bristles. An idea to be used does involve the combination of flesh, bone, and soul to provide a mummified spectral mount. As in, so it's got like a mummified torso and head and all of that, but the legs are ethereal, so they don't get ensnared. They can just like go straight through terrain. I'm just imagine a, that. Mm, a soft, comfortable mount that suffers not from the labors of travel, though this is if a horse were to be used. In a fantasy world with all manner of creatures, animals, and monsters, using a horse is typical, but might not be preferred. If someone is putting that much effort into a mount, surely you'd want the mount to be worthwhile. So why not go the extra mile and say get like if you look at if you look at mounts in WoW, just look at any of those, just just pick one and mummify it. Yeah, I mean the um, dragon seems like a good choice. Mm. Lord of the Rings moments. Fly, you fools. Yeah. <laughs> Additionally, this can work well for undead cavalry. A simple-minded undead cannot be expected to free themselves from their environments once ensnared. Removing or, or outright reducing the possibility of this does lead to a better overall result. Like, I kind of something can be said about sort of like the Tomb Kings and Warhammer in Total War Warhammer Two, because if mm -hmm. you notice, the undead cavalry is it's it's just they've got skeleton cavalry and they're running around, and while the cavalry isn't that good for the Tomb King, like the 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 those ones aren't that good in my opinion. I don't use a lot of them. I'm I'm mostly focused on construct armies anyway, but um over Tomb Kings. But something I've always thought of with that is if you have it, like if you take the Tomb Kings to uh, up north to Grimgore, Bretonia, or all, all up there. So you so you've got and so you go like further up, so you've got swamps and you've got forests and you've got this and that. If a horse, if a skeleton horse was to get ensnared in foliage, how is it going to get itself free? What can you do to get it free? Wouldn't a skeleton horse be less likely to get ensnared because it's got like less stuff to get ensnared? Or am I imagining it wrong? Oh no, no, no! You're absolutely correct on that. I mean, like because of how uh, it is, like with the rib cage and all like the pointy bits. All oh, right, like snagging on stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It's like we're, we're just like with the legs themselves. Like the legs themselves were just fine because they could just they could just go straight through. They they they're piss easy. Um, I mean, like I mean, like with all like the pointy bits, the stuff that can get stuck, ensnared, trapped. You know, like imagine imagine a horse. Um, a, a, imagine your skeleton cavalry getting from point A to point B, and, and when they get to point B, most of the ribs are just wrecked because of they've been caught on stuff. Yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about. I've never thought of that before, but you're right. It is a problem. Uh, but you also may like realize that depending on a setting, rib cage is not really necessary for a skeleton. The purpose well, actually... of the rib cage is to protect the heart and, and the and the organ. Yeah, that. that's actually a really good point. I'm, oh god, I'm I'm picturing it's like skeletons without, without a rib cage. <laughs> A rib cage. Oh god, that is cursed. That's something no, that should, that's something no, that it's not, it's not just that. A skeleton, but you invert the their rib cages. <laughs> I actually wouldn't mind that. Cradle. Oh, I mean Christ. I mean Gordon already kind of like has a rib cage thing sticking out of his uh sticking out of his backside, so I think that there was a point about I believe it was the 
Vikings, but I may be wrong. Mm. Uh, it was a form of torture where they would, uh, I think, turn the ribs inside out. Oh, right? the blood eagle oh, no, thing. Turn the lungs inside oh. out. I think it was uh, make. It was called the eagle. Um, so that's that's what I'm thinking of when I when I how I, I how think you totally look it up because I I don't remember all the details, but yeah. how do you turn back then? How do you turn someone's lungs <laughs> inside out? Right. No, 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 not the lungs, but it was it was more like the rib cage. You would turn it inside out and like have how? A, it was an eagle because like um, I'm not sure exactly how it happened, but long story short, you would open the rib cage, right? And right. um and like I'm not sure if it wasn't like done from behind or something like that, but like yeah, you would like open the rib cage. Actually, let me um let me look it up. I think it's and called the Blood it. Eagle. Okay. Blood Eagle, yes. When Halfton cracks open a warm one with the boys. <laughs> hey. Um after this Blood Eagle, I think that So High should do his point. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's just been pretty much the other parts. It's uncertain whether it was actually done, but yeah, uh, yeah, carve an eagle on his back with a sword, cut the ribs all from, yeah, all from the backbone, so from the and draw the lungs there out. Ugh. And gave to Odin the victory he had won. So essentially, yeah, okay. how would the person uh, actually survive? And as in, surely after a certain point, the person would just yeah not be yeah. alive. Yeah, yeah. For certain points, uh, yeah. the body can't withstand a pain yes. tolerance. Like people will die because uh, from like getting whipped. So they yes. get whipped too many times in one session. They just die because the brain can't handle that much pain. Yeah. Yes. Gross. Either way, um, yeah, yeah, that is that is very interesting um, proposition, and um, yeah, I, 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 I think that the person it, it was not the point of like it's the person surviving at the end. I don't think they were trying to to get them to talk it or anything. I think it was just like it was an execution. Yeah, it was when, when you're bored, but you got the whip, so you may as well use it. Yeah, yeah. How to create? A, a natural undead zombie. Just do that shit. He'll come back on his own. <laughs> God, I can think. All I can think about now is a skeleton with an inverted rib cage, as in like the rib cage yep. is, is is on the back, right? And you've got yeah. a barrel, and you've got a barrel of explosives stuck in there, oh. and the skeleton is just sprinting. But the thing is that we could, <laughs> like we were, like I already mentioned that for the skeleton podcast, and really we sh I should have mentioned this in that as well. But I'm just thinking of that, and it would work so fucking well because it's on the back. It's it's less likely to be actually shot hmm. or damaged on the on the way to you know eating himself into blowing shit up yep huh okay so Ooh. hi let's do your bit yeah uh we kind of did talk about mine yeah throughout the podcast just basically like you know mummies have varying strengths they can just use other roles um but there's one thing I, I didn't share for you. Like, what kind of magic would like an undead priest use? Like, there's a certain thing. Uh, I believe it's a certain ability they can use. Like, um, mummies can uh, use. Uh, how do I say? Like, yeah, that's just that. Magic. Like, maybe sand magic. There's also like um, just they're kind of like uh, like the equivalent of a cleric, but for the undead. Like a um, reconnecting dead cleric. should make it last longer. Yeah, it's like an unholy cleric, except it's not really somebody who's practicing it. It's because they're literally connected to it. You've made like, what is... kind of magic? There is um, in Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen, you do have liches, but there's also a boss you can fight called a Dark Bishop, I think it is. And the idea is, it's 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 like a card, or it's like a Dark Cardinal, or whatever it is. But it's it's a card. It's got like a Cardinal Pope hat on, and the idea is that it's corrupted, so it's undead, but it still uses holy magic, and that dark magic actually works really good against it. Despite its current state, oh. so I think I think it, I think for that it mostly depends on the setting and the world. Um, that is true. I'm trying to think. Like um, what? Uh, what about like the uh, Warhammer Tomb Lords? Don't like the Warhammer Tomb Lords have their own kind of Zed magic skills? Uh, the vampire, um, like the Carsteins, they have 
isn't don't they mostly have like lore of vampires? Like you've got lore of vampires. Yep. Uh you've got lore of the deeps for the vampire coast. Um Oh, sorry, what? Yeah, like, I thought it was like the Tomb Lords who had like their own unique magic. Like, yes, the yeah. Vampires. Yeah, they've Vamp they've got they've got like um oh they've <sighs> they've got the god magic from their gods like Petra and all that shit. Yeah, so they have so they have like a, a tornado of, is it like a tornado of schools? They've got like hands coming out the ground. They've got all kinds yeah. of shit. Oh yeah, I think I've ever seen that. Don't they also have like soul magic where you have got like the realm of souls and they just draw from that? Yeah. For their oh, uh, for, for their artillery and whatnot. Oh, by the way, I fucking love the mummy voice that the lich priest has. It's so funny. Um, I'm trying to remember. How does that go? Realm of the dead. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm. Yeah, I'm thinking of Cartep now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that guy. Nice. I just because with with Set with Setra, it's it's more the case of. I am gonna be the God King, motherfuckers. With with Kartep, it's <laughs> with, with, yeah. and with Arcan and with Arcan, it's Enchin because I'm Enchin. <laughs> and then and then you've got and then you've got like those other laws, and they're, they're like like uh, pss, hey hey, find my harem, cunt. Yeah, f f find find it now. Uh, yeah, I like the real sort of raspy mummy sounding voice. Uh. <laughs> anyway, um. I've thought up two other examples of mummies using magic to answer so high's question. So, uh, right. for anyone that's played Diablo 2, in the desert area, when you go into the tombs, there's these sort of gigantic mummies with, like, the head of, like, a dog or something. And they basically shoot these little black stars at you. And they also raise skeletons. So they're kind of, like, um, support units for the undead. So basically, Egyptian ninja mummies. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're talking about like a Anubis. The yeah. guy dead. Or like their yeah. representation. I'll find a picture real quick. Uh, the other one is in Tales of Majael. They have a swarm of shadows around them. I have a question. Oh, I, I have something to yeah. have something to say. Because I've just thought to myself... Because I've not played Khalidi yet in Warhammer. And I just thought to myself, wait a minute. She's mummified. Doesn't she have poison in her veins or whatnot? Yeah, probably. I'm not sure. Is poison an effective um, thing to preserve a corpse? <laughs> I guess formaldehyde is kind of poison. Okay. Ah, oh, okay then. Did we just open up a whole new topic of discussion, like poison mummies and the like? Sure, we can go into it. We've still got some time. Um, did you two want to say anything else? Because I feel like I might have interrupted a little bit. I... No, not really. I mean, I pretty much covered my points throughout the whole podcast. It was like going piece after piece. Mm. I just wanted to go over the types of mummies again real quick so that everyone knows the, the different kinds. Go for it. Okay, one sec. This document gone. There it is. So, the different types of mummies you can have maybe there's more I can't think of, but these are the ones I can think of. You've got the Egyptian one. You've got the tar one, which would be really good for mummies on the fly because maybe you can find a tar pit with old dinosaurs in it and raise them up. Then you've got the formaldehyde mummy. You've got the Xin Sui mummy, which is the Chinese one that's been preserved in some kind of unknown solution. Really interesting to look up on that one. You've got the amber mummy. You've also got the ice mummy. Then you've got a salt mummy, which we didn't discuss, but it's kind of similar to the Egyptian one. And you've also got the one that Seventh was talking about, which is like the sand mummy. Question. For the assault one, is it is it the mummy being arrested for attacking somebody, or is it just the mummy uh, that has died after playing League of Legends? <laughs> Either one, probably. There's some salty mm. bastards in that game. <laughs> yes, that's me done. I'm just I'm I'm trying to think now for poison mummies. I'm just sort of like thinking the uses of it all and and all of that. And it's just I'm just kind of sort of like thinking of undead with poison in them, on them, so on and so forth. It's I think uh, it's a good point. 
besides poison to raise the notion of them being cursed. Oh um, shit! Yeah, yeah. We, I think, yeah, curses are something else as well with mummies because th that's that is quite unique to them as well. Uh, yes, that is considered quite unique, and the notion of mummies being cursed is relatively old, if I'm correct. Uh, I mean, I mean, like. Of course, there was some kind of notion of like, hey, don't dig up the old pharaoh's tomb, even though we know that there's gold in there, because, you know, like, some kind of curse is going to befall you. But honestly, um, there have been, if I remember correctly, with regards to the, um, the, the history books that I've read, there have been people steal even egyptians stealing the, the you know from from those those places so it's not it wasn't just you know western um western uh settlers just coming there and stealing no, no, no it was it was like like e egyptians of of the later ages have done that as well mm. um so it was essentially um you know it, it had happened and, isn't oh sorry go on uh, and I assume that no real curse befell them, but I mean, like, you know, I, I in general, I would say that the notion of a curse uh, being laid on, on the tomb or on the corpse itself or the corpse being able to lay curses is a very interesting avenue. Uh, there could be, a, like, a reason or an authority with which they lay those curses. So, for example, you can have a situation along the lines of like, you know, tomb is cursed, you know, if, if you enter it, you, you get cursed yourself. Okay, that's that's simple. But like, what if a mummy of a pharaoh can lay a curse on any group of individuals he had, like, power over in life? Like, what if a pharaoh can curse um, his people until they bow to him again? You know? That'd Sounds very... Sounds very tyrannical, that. Yeah, but effective. <laughs> it works. Yeah. Um, something to say about curses. Uh, there was a was there's a mummified body called uh, Otzi Utsi. Is it Utsi? Utsi. Yeah. Yeah. And doesn't uh, doesn't that one have a curse? Or isn't that one said to be cursed because of mis uh, misfortune and unfortunate incidents that have happened to people that have touched or worked with it? I'm not sure. I was uh, remember that there was a. Tell me, let me just. So I'm not talking bullshit. Let me just quickly t uh, Google it. Um. Uh, it says people die. Arcy was discovered high. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, but so did murmurings about a curse built around the theory that the Iceman was angry at being disturbed after 53 centuries and quite and some yeah and people that worked with it had died like sometime after. But the fit the problem with this though. Is when it comes to like depending on the curse, it's awkward to tell the difference between a curse and just unfortunate incidents that have just happened in life. Like yeah. you can you can attribute any kind of misfortune to a curse if you've got yeah. the, if you've got the superstition with it. I mean, I probably don't believe in curses to be honest, but I think they're just meant to increase bad luck, right? Something like that? Like, um, I mean, in, fan in fantasy, you have curses for, like, weakness. Uh, uh, what? I mean, IRL, they're probably bad luck, but, like, they don't have to be bad luck mm. um, in our, you know, projected fiction. They can be, like, um, Old Testament-level uh, things, Old Testament-level uh, plagues. That's one thing that can be uh, that, let's say, a pharaoh could level. Um or they could be something along the lines of like you know diseases but like magical so like you enter the the tomb and suddenly some kind of diseases catches you 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 start spitting out your lungs or your uh, skin gets covered with festering boils you've entered like... into the tomb of <laughs> why are you here oh i'm here to loot your shit in that case i shall turn you into a russian Boom, you are now spitting out long. Is that a complete- <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think. I feel like, uh, curses can also be, like, something can be triggered. 
like one guy gets a curse, he doesn't know what uh, what it does, doesn't know what happens to him. But essentially, every time he trips, a pike comes out of the ground and tries to impale him. Holy shit! Every time he tries to trip, it's like increases like certain like um increase the chance of bad events happening or just kind of like um something that can get triggered in something that's like uh you just try to fall asleep then the sounds of the dead just starts keeping you awake at night that's like lovecraft uh lovecraftian in a way yeah uh, lovecraft has, didn't, didn't lovecraft have like two or three stories yeah. yes like yeah, that yeah, yeah. Where, where, where people get sort of they describe themselves running away from something unimaginable and then mm. they like die uh sometime later to some to some like like shelves falling on them you know um another thing about curses if i may yeah. is that they generally affect um entire bloodlines like mm. the, the descendants keep suffering from the the curse that happened to their ancestor like a thousand years ago for example you can see this. You can see this in most Hollywood uh, horror films, where a fa where a white family moves into a brand new suburban area, and the family's cursed. So then they move. The cur but the family's cursed, so it sticks with them, because of course it does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it kind of depends on how much of a dick the guy is. Mm. Like it could just affect one person. It could affect the bloodline. Um, two things I want to say. One is, you know, like if you're cursed, so, so when every time you fall over, there's going to be a pike coming out the ground. Can't that be exploited? Can't you just have somebody falling over with a chain on stuck to them so that they don't fall over? A pike comes out, they don't fall on it, and instead, that's free metal being made. I mean, huh. I'm pretty sure it, it it will just disappear. It's like one pike that's always following you. It's just like like you're going to be impaled by it eventually. You just don't know when. Because, like, are you going to really be able to catch yourself falling from the stairs? The bassoon, a sentient pike that follows you around. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh god, isn't it? Wasn't, wasn't it that slow? Oh, the great guardian, the form of the guardian, is that of a pike. Do you, it, on, it you, could, honestly. Have you guys ever seen that one fucking little video on YouTube? The, it's it's like the, the one where you've got that guy with a spoon, and he's like smacking somebody with a spoon oh, everywhere. Oh, that fucking video, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you've fine. got like this... Yeah, you've got like this guy in a hoodie, and he's supposed to be like the mo he's supposed to be your typical edgy undead ghost kind of guy, and he's got like a spoon, and he just keeps smacking somebody with a spoon, <laughs> and no matter what this guy does, no matter what he tries, the guy just keeps coming at him with a spoon, and then eventually the spoon breaks, and the guy's like, "Oh, I'm free," and then the guy like reveals his hoodie, and he's got like Morning. rows upon the rows of spoons room. stuck inside. <laughs> 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 um, the other thing. The other thing I was going to say, uh, when it comes to what the fuck was I going to say about curses? Um, when it comes to oh yeah yeah it was, it was yeah it, was, it comes with yeah it was with Lovecraft. It was uh, when, when it comes to curses for one of Lovecraft's stories, you had like this uh, hound, dog, winged beast thing that was tracking people down that had interacted. I think it was that they took something from a grave. The other one, if I remember correctly, was a sorcerer or a wizard who had. Uh, like, apparently he had cursed uh, a family, and every night one of them was dying, and I think the plot twist was he was actually going with a pillow and just asphyxiating them with the pillow. There was another one where every third, like, no family member could reach, like, the age of 30, because they'd die at that point. Something like mm. that. Uh, fun huh. fact, some, quite a lot of those curses could be explained with modern diseases. Yeah. Because uh, there are certain uh, genetic diseases that uh, essentially come out at a certain age uh, and sometimes it can be that the, the like disease is progressive so it, it's younger age for every subsequent generation that sounds very progressive does it also uh, say anything about uh, women's rights as well um i think that if it comes to uh diseases based on the x chromosome women do um suffer from them less so yeah it's pretty progressive if you ask me when the joke turns into education <laughs> okay all right yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the thing is we have yep. on x chromosome mm. and all of the uh genetic illnesses tied to gender are inside the the x chromosome there's almost nothing in the y chromosome there's just like stuff about uh 
the the um testosterone and like uh essentially formation of sperm and like that's about it in the the y chromosome so... i was gonna i was gonna say something about estrogen and soy then but i'm not going to <laughs> okay guys Whatever. uh long story been... short as i was saying yeah um education without post we've been uh, going so... on for about an hour and a half now okay i will just uh finish my point of uh men have only one x chromosome all of the genetic illnesses tied to gender are inside the, the x chromosome so like women have two and they're very often uh recessive which means that like if you have one that is wrong and one that is right the one that's right is going to kind of like mask the one that's wrong mm. yeah and you won't really feel the effects of the disease okay um, I was going to say something about like with uh, like genetic diseases and inbreeding and monarchies and whatnot, but uh, it's not it's not always the case, that is it? It's it's nah. Is that because because like, they did like a shit ton of incest and trying to keep the bloodline pure, quote unquote? It's, it's thing, yeah, yeah, yeah among, amongst other things. But you've also right. got it's like because of how people are with uh, like with with, mu with how mutations are, you can have both good and negative ones. So. Yes, and most often mutations are negative, probably. Mm. Yeah. So you so you get people that can be like born more intelligent, or you get people that are born like uh, with like thicker skulls, or they'll be born with certain yeah. things that can help them in life. But you'll also get the complete opposite. So and you see more of the complete opposite. Um, how should I say? If you inbreed, then you are very like significantly more likely to get the recessive uh illness showing Ill illnesses showing up and like recessive genes showing up rather than like accentuating the positive aspects it's better in general to if you are to breed uh to like have kids with someone who has the the either the same or similar positive um aspects and uh, you know, different everything else, right? Mm. I'm not entirely certain why the reason for that is, like why you can't really preserve the positive things very efficiently. I think it's, it's to do more, I think, with lack of genetic diversity, because if you look at ants, for example, yeah. um, ants that will, uh, like, f uh, future queens that start their own colonies, like, after so much time, they will become so genetically different to their progenitor uh, colonies and queens that they will actually compete with each other for resources yeah, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so and it's... I mean, that's the point of it, right? Because yeah. like, you yeah. gotta, you gotta evolve and all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's the yeah, it's you need you need more genetic diversity to ensure survival of the species. Basically, like if you stack if you stack it for too long, you're gonna die off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so... there's a reason for for diversity in in. We've we've gone too far, honestly. But... <laughs> I know, I know, but it's interesting. <laughs> Fucking interesting. <laughs> that's a, that's a topic for another thing. <laughs> Genetic <laughs> diversity and necromancy. That's a, that's another podcast. <laughs> um, speaking of uh, Cheb, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Would curses be their own podcast? Because we talk about undead, but what about like would rituals, curses, like certain types of magic, stitching? <laughs> Yeah, I like, think we should do that in another podcast. Fair enough. Yeah. I want to, like, nobody really ever try to discuss or look into, like, necromagic spells. It's always the undead or it's just great yeah, damage we'll, wizard. No. We'll cover uh, magic on another podcast. Let's, yeah. uh, let's wrap this up and yeah, yeah. Chip, edit this out when you have a moment later. Yeah, maybe I should. <laughs> yeah. All right. Imagine, imagine if he just keeps it in and he's just with there, like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but no 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 um yeah so let's let's wrap it up so um closing statements eh yep all right um thanks everyone for taking part we've learned a lot about mummies it's lovely to be here yeah thank you for having us Cheb and it was great to be able to uh say stuff on this podcast as well so see you later bye everyone tar mommy god girlfriend be like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>